now, no, but it was for a time, yeah. Oh, okay, well, a it, it had been, oh, yeah. talking about Sipico. Yeah, it had been in the last couple of days. After we came back uh, after the Women's Trade Union League convention in, uh, in Washington, I'd say about a year later, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt came here under the auspices of the Women's Professional Women's Club, Birmingham Business and Professional Women's Club to speak, and they were charging, it was a money-making affair, and they were charging for admission. She was going to speak at Al Ballard Auditorium. And uh, to my surprise, in the afternoon, long middle of the afternoon, Melvina Thompson, who was her secretary, called me and told me that they were giving a reception for Mrs. Roosevelt at the Tutwiler Hotel, beginning at 6 o'clock and that Ms. Roosevelt would like for me to come down and attend it. And uh, I put on my best dress and went down there. And I walked in. It was held on the mezzanine floor of the Tutwiler. And I walked in. Uh, Ms. Roosevelt saw me as I went in the door. She walked over to me and shook my hand and welcomed me in. And nobody would ever thought, you know, she remembered me from being up there and uh, gave me, uh, Melvina Thompson gave me a ticket to her uh, affair. And uh, we got in the cab, the uh, Business Professional Women's Club was furnishing cabs for everybody to ride up to the auditorium from the hotel. And I got in the cab with these women. Now, I wasn't working at the time. I had no job. And uh, they said, yo, you knew Ms. Roosevelt before. And I said, yes, uh, uh, I've been active uh, with the Women's uh, Trade Union League, and she's a member and been active for years in the Women's Trade Union League in New York State. And uh, <coughs> they said, where do you work? I said, out here at the Cotton Mill. <laughs> they didn't say anything else to me. They just clammed up. I don't know if they thought I was lying or what. They thought I wondered, I thought it was all some kind of a dignitary. I don't know what they thought because of attention Ms. Roosevelt gave me. And we got up to the uh, uh, Battle Lord Tarm, it's across from the courthouse, at huge Woodrow Wilson Park, which they have named now Lynn Park, which I think they shouldn't have changed the name of it. But it's called Lynn Park now. But that street was filled with people, and that park was filled with people. The hall was, the auditorium was full, which the seats were paid for. Out, there's more people outside than there were inside. And I had a pretty good seat myself right up front. When Ms. Roosevelt got up to speak, when she was introduced, she came on the stage. She said, ladies and gentlemen, I understand there's a lot of people outside who can't get in the building. And uh, I don't believe you would mind if I take a few minutes and go out there and speak to them first. And she did. And that's the type of person that Eleanor Roosevelt was. And that's how, uh, whatever they say about it, how many people criticized her, called her a nigger lover and everything else, and the people loved Eleanor Roosevelt. And she said in my presence one time, the longer I live, the less I care about what people says about me. Did she, did she ever tell you anything about the, the letters that she was getting from other cotton mill workers? Could you tell us about, were we, you know, one of the things, one of the legacies, it seems, of this early organizing was that some real leaders came out of this campaign. Well, we was all leaders. We didn't have nobody else. We had to lead ourselves. So everybody was a leader, really. And the local people who, uh, the local officers, were recognized as, as the leaders. And uh, if you didn't lead, you got put down and somebody else got in your place. The rank and file people in the textile industry in those days did the organizing and did the running of the union and did the handling of the strike. Because, as I say, the union didn't have enough paid representatives to commence to direct, like we. Later on, I learned how to do in the amalgamated. When we'd have a strike, we would have an organizer, 
on the picket line constantly. We picketed day and night. There was always an organizer on the picket line with the pickets to help and to advise and to see what went on. The, the, all that had to be done by rank and filers. And uh, ask about two leaders. <coughs> Tell us about Homer Welch. Homer Welch came here from Hogansville, Georgia, after the 34 strike. He was active in Georgia. And he came over here after the strike was signed to Alabama to work. And I went with Homer to some places. He and his wife, they rented a house not far, far from where we lived in Inslee Highland. And I went with him a lot of times on organizing uh, situations. And. Uh, was quite a, a good friend of Homer and his family. And because, like I said, they didn't live too far from us. He'd come by and pick me up, and, and I'd go uh, with him on organizing. And they went to Talladega. I went to Talladega a time or two with, with Homer. Tell us what kind of a man he was. A fi uh, Homer Welch was one of the finest men, I think, I think. Uh, Somebody told me uh, several years later, I had never seen Homer take a drink. I had a, 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 a theory uh, when I was a, uh, working in the shop that uh, I did not think that organizers ought to drink on the job. I don't think anybody ought to drink on the job. And I let it be known to any organizer come around and work with me if you come to a union meeting drunk, you might as well you're going to catch some flack from me because that's the quickest way to lose respect. Now, we had organizers who did drink. I think some of it was frustration. But none of them ever come to my union meetings drunk because I, I would have thrown them out the door. But Homer came up here, and I made the statement one time that I did not Ever had ever seen Homer take a drink, and I'd been around in a lot of social occasions and everything. But somebody told me years later that he did take some drinks. But since I had made that statement, he would never take a drink where I'd find it out. Because I, I did not ever, and I, but he had. He, did, he wasn't perfect, but he was a, a, a good family man, and honest and sincere, and a hard worker. It was just sad what happened to him. Could you talk about what happened to him? Well, during the 1934 textile strike, the mills at Talladega promised the workers that if they wouldn't come out on strike, that they would never go back to 12 hours a day or cut their wages. And I understand they bought guns. And every time they so you think that the here the flying squadron is coming, they shut the mill down and people get on top of the mills with their guns. I didn't see this, but I heard it. I believe it later. But uh, right after uh, the NRA was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, the Talladega Cotton Factory went back on 12 hours and cut wages. And the people walked out on strike. There was no union activity there, nothing. But Homer immediately went down there and did a magnificent job setting it up and pulling it together. And uh, the people were pretty, pretty mad. They'd been hoodwinked by the company, and after sticking with them through the strike and listening to them, they'd do this to them. They were very, in a very bad mood. And it was pretty evident that some of them were carrying guns. And uh, it, uh, Bib Graves, who was governor, who had sent people up here to talk to Homer about it. And one afternoon late, uh, Captain Potter Smith, the captain of the highway patrol, came up to talk to Homer. And uh, he was down near the picket line. And Homer, as Homer drove toward the picket line, Potter Smith stopped him. and he parked his car and was standing talking to Potter Smith, captain of the highway patrol. And uh, while they were talking, there was some cars 
it was just dark, the car lights had just been turned on, and they, these several cars was coming down the, the road that comes down in front of the mill and down by where Potter Smith and Homer was talking. And Homer remarked to Potter Smith, now this is a testimony Potter Smith gave in the trial. He said, Homer said, I better go move my car a little further out of the road. So it, before Homer got to the car, he said he heard the shots, the first shot he heard came from the top of a tree down by the picket line. And he said right after that, uh, for about 15 minutes, it was like the front fronts of France. And uh, of course later, Homer and Red Thornton were accused, there was a deputy sheriff killed, and uh, they were accused of, uh, arrested or put warrants, took out for murder. And uh, Red was put in jail, which he was found hung in jail. They claimed he hung himself, but there was bruises on his head and other things, which a lot of people thought that he did not kill himself. But Homer told me that when the shooting stopped, started, he told me this later, that he dropped to the ground and crawled under his car over into a ditch beyond and, and crawled out into a field of some weeds and laid there until he recognized Ted Williams' voice. Ted Williams was ran a labor newspaper here in Birmingham, and he was down there, and uh, he was looking for Homer. And when he didn't, he lay there and wouldn't answer until he recognized Ted's voice. And Ted got in and brought him to Birmingham and put him in jail, which the uh, Talladega authorities tried to get him moved. And he stayed in the Jefferson County Jail. They wouldn't release him to Talladega. And he stayed six months up in jail and uh, was only taken back down there for trial. And uh, of course, Red Thornton uh, had already gotten, was dead. And Homer was finally convicted for manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years in penitentiary. He served, I think, a little over a year and was paroled. At the end of that, okay, but now. he had nothing to do with the uh, well, Potter. If you believe, I have to believe what Potter Smith, who's a police officer who was there, and that was his testimony. But at the trial, Roderick DeVetto, who was a noted criminal attorney here, who was hired to uh, represent Homer, and uh, he was trying to show fraud in the jury because there was. The jury, he called names of people who had been dead for years, and the judge finally told him, he said, look, you're wasting your time. If you're trying to show fraud in the jury, you're wasting your time because I'm not going to rule in your favor. And uh, he was convicted of manslaughter, not murder. But it, they had had a run-in, the deputy sheriffs and, and uh, Homer uptown before during the day and had some words. Now ask him about Paul Christopher. Can you tell us about Paul Christopher? I uh, got acquainted with Paul right after the general textile strike. He was signed to Alabama and worked here in Birmingham for a while. And But I left here and I didn't know see Paul again until he showed up. He left the staff of the Textile Workers Union and I was on the uh, executive board of the Tennessee Labor Council. And uh, William Turnblazer, uh, district president of the mine workers, was president. Excuse me, we're not going to be able, we, we don't know a lot of these folks, oh. but we just know, we know who Paul was. All we right. know that he emerged well, as Paul, a real, very strong person. So if you could talk about Paul Christopher right. in a compact, strong well, way. Well, I'm like getting to what I know about him. Okay. Uh, Paul, uh, I was on the council, so uh, Paul had applied for a job as secretary of the uh, Tennessee Labor Council. William Turnblazer didn't know him, and William asked me if I knew him, and I said yes, and I recommended Paul for the job, and he went to work uh, as secretary of the Tennessee Labor Council, and I later on was legislative representative for the Tennessee Labor Council. 
and uh, he had an office. In fact, uh, back then in the days, we paid for his office, amalgamated, and the mine workers paid his salary while he worked as secretary. And his office was right next to mine, and I worked very close with Paul in Knoxville while he had that position. And then I went to West Tennessee, and uh, Paul, of course, still. Then they moved the office to Nashville, and uh, Paul died. And but I worked with him there in Knoxville for a while. So. Yeah. Was there any other questions? Well, yeah. You, last time, uh, and you mentioned it a little bit before. You were talking about um, how imp how important it is to not. Um, to not uh, organize the <coughs> union in secret, that it's critical no, to I'm come not. public. That that was something that, that I imagine well, once you, you go public, the strike. No, in the early days we had a, a, a much fairer law that would, uh, they would take in consideration actions. It wasn't, in, in other words, you didn't have to first prove that the company knew you was Prove definitely the company knew that you had union activity. I'm talking about people who are working in the shop as in plant organizers or active on the part of the union inside the shop. There are certain uh, things you can and can't do under the law. Today it's more restrictive than it was back in the early days. But uh, it's one of the hard, the company can find always something to fire somebody for if they want to. Although it might be for labor activity, you have to have a pretty strong case in order to protect somebody. I never used the law in organizing because uh, <coughs> you had to have more than that to organize a shop. That just give you some rights to protect you. But actually, the company still could do almost anything they wanted to, and, and it was up to you to prove it, you see. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. I think we should break. I'd give her some of the tide in Texas along. I said, hell, I ain't got to go in. I'd just say, you can go over hunting Texas every time you get knocked back in. You can just stop it. We go on day for her to tie one leg. Mm. She wasn't going to tie. She was just trying to sweep him from the edge of her and see what would happen. She uh, can't. Uh, real, I, I wouldn't be. Well, I don't know what their address is. Let me know when she's ready to talk. Watch your boom shadow up on the boom, please. Oh, you can start anytime, Bill. Well, I'm looking for Hal Hilton's address. Oh, here's Shelby. I'll tell you, I write him about once a month. Keep going now, Daniel. Thank Go. you for contacting me. Did it usually say call your contact and, and know that I'll keep that in mind and so on and so forth?
find it easier to work in, in a union shop where mm -hmm. there's a method in it. Uh, uh, that you don't uh, have to be uh, listening to everybody coming in uh, with every little thing, you know, telling them little every little thing, you know. Well, they can't, how, if they listen to people's complaints all day long, how, they wouldn't find no time to them there. If they, if they say, my door's open, come and talk to me in time, you know they couldn't do it. They wouldn't have no time to carry on their business, would they? Mm -hmm. They'd be sitting all day long listening to workers come in if the workers really felt free to do that. Oh, my zoo. You see my monkey? They took them our, our gorillas away. From the zoo? Yeah, they had to move them because they had to... I, um, Saturday, day we went out and had a big cake and bid yeah. them farewell. Oh, good time. And uh, there's That's two wonderful. of them. That's a wonderful picture. I belong to the Friends of the uh -huh. Birdie Zoo. Uh -huh. and, uh, but you're getting the cheetahs here, aren't you? <laughs> uh-huh. But they got to take them away to, to, yeah. to learn how to yeah. uh, reproduce and carry yeah. on sexual activity oh. from another adult. That'd, that'd be rather interesting because this is a state that uh, shot down half a dozen uh, adult satellites. Yeah. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Here they are showing, showing adult movies to animals. <laughs> <laughs> We never did ask you what you thought of Ryan. His name. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody the other day asked him about how well he did. I can't think. Well, of course, I'm, I wouldn't give him credit unless he did. I can't think of nothing I, I agree with him on. But he was such a dud to me. He's not interested. He's just. Well, he's not, he's not sincere. You want to look right into my camera? And that Nancy looks like a spider. Her daughter, that daughter's writing them books. And and breaking the law. If one come in my hand somewhere, yeah. that I might read it. But and I ain't paying no money for having it. Count 30 seconds, and I'll go in and hold for 30. You know, uh, I was reading the Sunday club. paper talking about people talk, naming people they thought the hardest people in this. Beryl Cuomo actually named Richard Nixon. That's what? As a smart man. And he may be smart, but, but he's crook. Yeah. I know he's Can you smart. You read that? But yeah, he's cutting off the ice. He's a crook. crook. Y'all know him then. No question. And Harlem and the Arab women had yeah. been with him all those years. They knew exactly what he wanted to yeah. do. Yeah. No question. There's his alter ego. Yeah. And they knew exactly. He they, he didn't have to tell them. Okay. They knew exactly what to do. And I was sitting there, the girls rolling my hair. And they was talking about it, about Richard, and whether he did know it or not know it, about the Iran Contra thing. And so okay. Flora, the lady on the beauty shop, said, "What do you think, you said? Do you think that uh, that he knew anything about?" It? I said, "He didn't know about nothing else. Why would he know about that?" <laughs> That ended the conversation. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Him not knowing he had it, but it was uh, something that important the president ought to have nobody working for him that didn't let him know about it. Huh? I mean, absolutely. Yep. It's not that way. I was trying to think oh, of They always were talking around about that bank, BCCI. No. Mm -hmm. I was trying to remember something I, I read the damn much. Something a long time ago about a bank offshore. That first line? Yeah, and it didn't deal with the inaugural thing. It said the guy will be cut off for working his minimum for 22 years. 42 and, years. And there's been a will for it, and there's an organizer, and he was able to reside in and live in the state of Texas. And it stated in Western South Carolina, return to Alabama in 1876 to grow up to become a joint manager of the North Alabama Board. We're going any slower, it'll take forever, so. And it didn't deal with the Mississippi Seven, 814 with Blunt Miller was in 12 ships, five days a week, and only one half hour. 12 kids, 12 hour kids, not 12 kids. Yeah. However, the seven kids who were free from the bounty being paid to Henry Ford for the company of that was free. The same story now from three days to the bounty. And the half bounty believes in a union. Some penny men so strong in Mississippi and in the Mississippi and people where they don't make mistakes that will hurt them in the long run. I don't know what he meant by that, but yes, I think Peggy Dobby wrote that, but 